if you were the greatest at something, wouldn't you be tempted to say so? Remember Muhammad Ali always said, I am the greatest. And you hear that from a lot of athletes. Um, you certainly can't run for high office if you don't think you're the absolute best person for the job and are willing to say so convincingly. But if you knew, nothing doubting, that you were the greatest at whatever it is, wouldn't you just have to say it? To act like it? To walk and talk like it? But Jesus didn't. And he most certainly was the greatest. Jesus was humble. He was poor in spirit. He advocated taking the back seat, promoting others, and keeping quiet at times. And we talk about being godly or Christ-like, and I think the song we just sang uh, was the perfect song to lead into this. But what does that mean, to be like God, to be like Christ? We, we know what it means to be a self-promoter. We know how to boast, to be proud. But how about to be like Jesus? What does that look like? I want us to think about that for a few weeks. And especially from the Gospel of John. That Jesus makes some pretty clear statements throughout John's Gospel about how to live like him. How to be like God. He's training his disciples throughout. And uh, last week, we, we sort of led into this. If you remember, we, in our lesson, talked about I will versus thy will. Where we underline uh, the Lord's statement as he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane to the Father, not my will, but thy will be done. Garden of Gethsemane was the, not the only place that he displayed that attitude. Uh, he does it over and over, and in the Gospel of John, especially John chapter 6, verse 38 is an example. I think it's sort of a personal mission statement of the Lord. He says, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So you see it again, not my will, but thy will. Jesus, both in word and deed, and, and even in the highest pressure situations of his life, like the night before he was crucified, affirmed the fact that he was not here to do what he wanted, but to do what God wanted. That is being godly. That's what Christ-likeness looks like. But a second way that Jesus showed this comes to us in John chapter 7. Again, it's a period of high conflict, high pressure on Jesus. At the beginning of this chapter, John 7, he is encouraged by his brothers to go up to Jerusalem for the greatest feast of the Jews, the Feast of Tabernacles, sometimes called Booths. <laughs> Booths. B-O-O-T-A. In case. But we'll call it Tabernacles. This feast occurred in the fall of the year. Not long from this, this time, really. September, October. Lasted about a week. It was the most popular feast of Judaism. Commemorated the way that God cared for Israel as they wandered through the wilderness. And it was also sort of a harvest celebration uh, at that time. And... Jesus chooses to wait for a bit to go up to the feast. Maybe he didn't want to cause a stir. He was very popular at this time. Maybe he didn't want to draw a lot of attention to himself at the beginning of the feast. But he travels to Jerusalem, the scripture says, in, in secret. And he arrives sometime about the middle of the week of this feast. I just want to read a few verses beginning at verse 14 of chapter 7 of John. 
So it says there, about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple, began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. So again, we've had this idea of not my will, but thy will. And now in this passage, we have what? Not my teaching, but his teaching. That's an important attitude for, for godliness. You want to be Christ-like? You have to be willing to accept his teaching, not your own. And if, if Jesus had to do that, surely we have to do it. Verse 16 again, my teaching, he said, is not mine, but him who sent me. Not mine, but his. So important. It's really a fascinating scene here at the temple during this great feast this particular fall. Uh, Jesus goes up into the, the temple court. He begins to teach. No doubt he wasn't the only one that was doing this. There were many rabbis that, that would have stood and taught at feast times. It's a big area. But there's something outstanding about Jesus of Nazareth. He's the greatest teacher that ever lived. And people flocked to hear him whenever he was near. He impressed people. He, he amazed people. He always had. Even when he's 12 years old. Go read that story in Luke chapter 2. How impressive he was as a, a young boy in the temple. So he's no doubt garnering a, a lot of attention on this occasion as he taught. And the Jews are amazed at this. If you look at verse 15 that he could do this so well. They're amazed because, quite frankly, he didn't have any degrees. No, he hadn't gone to the right schools. And there was no great rabbi that, that he studied under. So they're, they're just amazed. Here's how you became a great teacher in Israel. You're born into a, a faithful Jewish home. You grow up going to school, memorizing lots of scripture. In fact, basically all of scripture. You attend synagogue services. You listen to teachers. You hear the Bible read all through your growing up years. At some point, you attach yourself to a great teacher of the law. You attach yourself to a rabbi and you study under him. And you learn basically what all the previous great rabbis have said about the Bible. You memorize all that. And then eventually you become a teacher as well. That's the PhD program in ancient Israel. Jesus only did a small part of that. He never studied under a great rabbi. But he was a great influential teacher. He, he never identified himself with the a certain group of the Jews, like, like the Pharisees, but the crowds flocked to him, nevertheless. And so the natural question that people were asking was, how does he do it? How is he doing this? And Jesus answers their question in verse 16. He says, it's not my teaching, but his teaching. Jesus learned of God. Jesus was trained by the Heavenly Father. His deg degree came from heaven. So part of becoming a, a Christian and remaining a faithful disciple is having this perspective. We are learners of God. We don't develop our own views or promote our own opinions we don't pick and choose the things in the Bible that we think are important and not important. No, 
for us, it's not my teaching, but his teaching. Right? Has to be. It was it was that way for Jesus and and we're we're in his name, Christian, so it must be that way with us. Not my teaching but his. Not my will but his. Not mine, but his. Now what's said in verse 17 is really important too, I think. Because you know, someone might ask, okay. I get what you've said so far. They're, they're all, but, but there are all these different teachers in the world. There's all these different teachings. How can we know what's right? Everybody seems to be saying something different. Maybe you're wondering that. Remember, there were a lot of teachers in the temple. No doubt on that very day that Jesus spoke, a lot of people up speaking and teaching. Jesus stands out. And he says that there's a way to discover who's true and who's false. What's, what's true and what's not. He says in verse 17, if anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. Oh, how important that statement is. Even today, what's he saying? He's saying that true seekers will, will, will find truth. They will discover God's way. A person has to truly, sincerely wish to know and to do the will of God. And if that's the case, they will indeed discover it. God will not keep truth hidden from an honest seeker. So part of figuring out who's true and who's false is faith. You have to believe in God, you have to want to learn of Him, and be very sincere and earnest in that. And if you are, God will reveal His truth to you. It may take time. It may call for hard work, lots of study, some persistence, but it'll happen. Jesus says, if anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know. If you're seeking truth today, keep it up. Be sincere. Stick with it. God will deliver. It's just a promise of the Lord. And finally, Jesus reminds us again in verse 18 of this important attitude that you have to have. He says, The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true and in him there is no falsehood you catch what he said I think really this is the key to the whole passage the key to this entire idea of not my teaching but his I heard someone say once it's impossible at one and the same time to give the impression that Jesus is a great savior and that I am a great preacher. You know, to preach Christ, you see, is to point people to Jesus, not the preacher. To teach about God is to direct people to God and not to impress them with oratory, skillful rhetoric, storytelling ability, personal magnetism, whatever. So Jesus says on this day in the temple, in essence, I'm not here to promote myself, but God. I am not here to get glory, but to give glory to my Father. The only glory Jesus asked for in the Gospel of John is a cross. That's one of the ways that we know Jesus is the truth. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Not my teaching, but his teaching. Are we willing to deep down where it really matters to make that commitment? It might 
call for us to make some changes in some things that we've always thought. Do we not still have things to learn from God? No matter how old we are in the faith? Does Jesus not still have some things to teach us? He certainly does me. I, I need to be willing to say and really mean it. Not mine, but His. Not my will, but His will. Not my teaching, but His teaching. And, and next week, Lord willing, we're going to move on in this fourth gospel, study a little bit more about this word glory, and whose glory we ought to seek. I thank you for listening today. Remember your headline. Write your headline. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this glorious day and that you've given us a place and a time to meet and to worship you, to build one another up. We pray we, we've done that and that we'll continue to. Thank you for each person here and the blessing they are to everyone else here. Help us to be a blessing to your world and to bring you glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.